Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, July 30th. Good to have you on board, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers. Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, joining me in the virtual studio today is my colleague, Brian O'Rourke. He's the senior editor for Proceedings, and we're going to talk about shipbuilding, or maybe rather a lack thereof for the U.S. Navy. <laughs> Brian, how are you today? I, I'm good. I'm just working to keep my blood pressure down before we start this conversation. Yeah, so. this is a this is a challenging conversation, <laughs> right? Um, and and you'd have to be hiding under a rock for the past decades not notice that the Navy has been severely challenged in buying, building, maintaining ships at anywhere near uh, you know on cost and and on schedule. And, um, you know, this is not meant as a, as a hit or a criticism of, uh, of sailors and officers who are manning and running and, and getting the best out of the ships that the Navy has succeeded in buying. Um, it's really a hit on, you know, it, it's such a, I think, a, a multifaceted, you could call it a Rubik's Cube problem. There's a whole bunch of contributing factors um, decisions that were made some in some cases 20, 30 years ago. Um, and some of those decisions were made by folks in the Pentagon. Some of them were made by administrations. Some of them were made by Congress. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a multifaceted problem. And we've made a, a commitment to not stop talking about this problem until it starts to get better. Uh, from our perspective here at the Naval Institute, I know this is true for our news team, that has been covering this problem for the past five, uh, 10 years, really, since they've been in existence, Sam Legrone and company, um, you know, you, you, we, we can't stop talking about this because um, if you stop talking about it, the pressure will go away and, you know, we'll probably continue to get more of the same, which is, um, which is really unacceptable. Yeah. It's absolutely unacceptable. One of the other things that we wanted to do today was to invite people, no matter what you are, you know, you, you can use the parable of the, you know, the three blind men and the elephant, right? The elephant here being the shipbuilding problem and people who are on ships and serving on different classes of ships have one feel for the problem. Those who are in shipyards and doing maintenance have perhaps another aspect of the problem that they can shed light on. If you're in industry, I'm sure you've got, um, you know, a, a, a a side of the of the perspective on why the problem is what it is. Um, perhaps you're in Congress or working, um, you know, on Capitol Hill as a as a staffer, and uh, you've got some insight into decisions that are being made about the Navy budget. Um, perhaps you work in OpNav. Perhaps you work in NavC. Wherever you uh, are relative to this problem, we want to hear from you. We're we're looking to publish a series of articles on how to improve uh, the Navy's shipbuilding programs over the next you know, couple of years. We're gonna publish those over the next couple of years in, in hopes that over the next decade, this problem gets uh, solved and we get back to a place where the Navy is um, not just the best Navy in the world, but the best, um, the best shipbuilding Navy, the best uh, at innovating and, and building you know, capacity and building ship, uh, building ships and maintaining ships um, in the world. So, with that, uh, to to get us started, um, Brian, you know, start big picture with some of the the main things that are on your mind in terms of, you know, the the problem statement, if you will. Uh, gosh, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> where to start? I mean, this is part of the problem, right? Um, if I could say where the problem started, I could say how to solve the problem. But there's so many, I, th I think maybe the biggest problem is, one, any project like this today takes years to get ready to go. That's not because anybody's doing anything wrong. It's not because, um, you know, people can't 
act quickly, it's because a warship is an incredibly complex system. You know, you could design a Fletcher class in a lot less time than you can design a Constellation class frigate because the systems were pretty straightforward. Eventually, they bolted radar on, but at the beginning, they were just um, they were just ships. Uh, so now there's so many different people and organizations involved over such a long time horizon. It's hard to keep your focus on what you're doing. There is nobody who started a shipbuilding project who saw it all the way through who had enough authority to say stop. Right. And so you get a hold of people in various shipbuilding organizations within the Navy. And every time, you know, every two years when a new somebody rolls in, they they have new ideas. They think it should be this. The threat environment has evolved. Our cap capabilities for weapons have evolved, whatever it is. Um, and I think the system rewards people for contributing. And contributing is nebulous to me. I, I mean, I you know, I've never been a part of this. I this is my observation from the outside. But um, I, if you're going to give somebody a bullet point for changing a system, and then two or three years later, you're going to give that person's successor a bullet point for unchanging it, it's very hard to keep your eye on the target. Um, but there's so many different people contributing to this problem. They can all say, well, it wasn't my fault, right? If you were going to show that chart that we published a couple months ago, comparing the FREM design on which the Constellation class is allegedly based to the Constellation, and there's a defensive note on it. It says, you know, we've changed all these things, but note the contractor suggested all these changes. Okay, I mean, maybe that was true when it went from 85% common uh, and 15% new, but but now it's the other way around. It's 15% in common and 85% new. And I really doubt the contractor said, you know what we need to do is change 85% of this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, um, I, I'll just want to go through a couple of the programs that we're talking about to sort of baseline things here, right? Uh, so if you, you go back to the Zumwalt class destroyers, uh, which, as you said, was part of um, SC-21 family. Service combatant for the 21st century. Service combatant for the 21st century, which was going to be the, the Zumwalt class. Um, and then it was, there was going to be a new class of cruiser, and there was going to be littoral combat ships. So those three things were part of that SC-21 program. 20 years ago. Um, we never got the, the new improved cruiser. Um, we uh, started to build the Zumwalt class, um, and those were supposed to, the Navy was supposed to buy 32 Zumwalt classes. We ended up with three. Um, most notable problem with that, the, uh, the rail gun or the advanced gun system, you know, never came to fruition. And now they've taken that gun system off because the, uh, uh, the projectiles were going to cost about eight hundred thousand dollars per round, per artillery round, um, and so now now the Zumwalt class destroyers, all three of them, don't have the gun system that they were originally sort of built for. Right? They were designed to stand in close, and deliver long range artillery, large you know large caliber artillery uh, from a stealthy platform. Uh, just off the coast in support of, you know, Marines uh, and, and Army troops ashore. So here's a, here's a great thing about that gun. Um, there was a notion once they realized that the artillery shell was, you know, just too expensive, not going to work. And somebody said, well, why don't we use the Army's Paladin shell? It's about $50,000 around, still a crap ton of money for a, can I say that? Heather, you might need to enter me out. Um, a large ton of money uh, on on these things, but, you know, less than 10%. But the gun caliber is off by just enough that you can't use it. So left hand didn't talk to right hand. Nobody said, hey, what should we do? It was, let's design a shell and then fit a gun around it. Yeah. Uh, which is a weird way to go about it when you see the price escalating. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted your flow. 
Yeah. Uh, so the, the the second one that is, uh, you know, pro shipbuilding program that has famously gotten a lot of red ink over the last uh, five, six years was the Ford class carrier. Right. And so uh, newest aircraft carrier replaced the Nimitz class, new reactor plant, um, electromagnetic uh, arresting gear, electromagnetic um, uh, catapults, uh, new radar system, a whole bunch of new technology. At least weapons some, elevators. Weapons elevators. That's right. The electromagnetic weapons elevators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no, so this was one where, and I've I've heard several different senior retired Navy admirals um, pin a lot of the the, the blame for this uh, problem on uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. So this in in 2000, 2001, 2002, when the Navy came to the defense secretary and said, we want a new class of carrier because we're getting to the end of building these Nimitz class carriers. We need something new. And, uh, and he said, we also talked to um, uh, Tal Manville about this. So he's written about it for us and been on the podcast about it. Uh, and so Rumsfeld said, um, well, I'll, I'll allow that, but I'm not going to let you build a new class of carrier unless it is a revolutionary new ship, right? And instead of having a spiral development program where you incorporate just a couple of new technologies into the chip with the first hull, and then the second hull you add more, and the third hull you add more, right? You slowly develop this into a new set of capabilities. Rumsfeld said, read my lips, Navy. It's all or nothing. And then some of those capabilities, they were allowed to put prototypes ashore. For example, the electromagnetic catapults, uh, they built a shore-based prototype up at Lakehurst, New Jersey. And that part of the program worked very well because they could prototype it, right? Prototype and test the hell of it, out of it ashore. They were not allowed to do a prototyping of the electromagnetic weapons elevators. So lo and behold, you get weapons elevators with very small tolerances on a carrier um, and they realize that, oh, my goodness, um, we have to redesign these or, you know, really do a lot, a lot of work to fix them. So that that whole ship became later and later to delivery. You know, now the second and the third one will probably be closer to on on time and, and on budget delivery. But that was a decision for the Ford that was made. Um, against the Navy's advice, right? But, but it was made by the uh, Defense Secretary. Um, third one is the littoral combat ships. So these were part of that SC-21 family. We're going to build Street Fighter, as Admiral Sobrowski famously uh, came up with this idea, former uh, president of the Naval War College and a sort of transformational um, and, and, all, and a frequent proceedings contributor back in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, a street fighter concept, small, inexpensive, high speed, uh, probably captained by a lieutenant, lieutenant commander, or small crew, you know, get in, get out, operate in the littorals, um, delivered at a, at that time, promise of $100 million max per ship. Um, and then the, the decision got made by Congress instead of down selecting to one design where you had the freedom and the independence class is built by two different companies and you're supposed to have a you know a head to head competition and then down select to one of them and congress said no nah, we're not going to down select we're going to build 18 or so of each of them so that's a decision not made in the pentagon not made by the navy but made by you know folks in congress uh, which is really a, a very bad decision right it's like all right we're going to we're going to have tryouts for the olympic team and uh, we're supposed to down select to you know the top six, you know guys or women in the on the this particular team, and no, no, we're going to take all twelve. We'll take all twelve and try it out, right? So that's more expensive. Um, you you end up with a watered down team, et cetera. Um, the third one I wanted to talk about, or fourth one I guess, is um, uh, on submarine construction. You know, we uh, coming out of the Cold War, we had the um, uh, the Connecticut, the the, the um, Seawolf class. Um, that was another one, super expensive. The Soviet Union went home, Soviet Navy went home and rusted at its peers. And we realized, well, wait a minute, this, this class of submarine, maybe we don't need it. And it's very, very expensive. So instead of building 25, 30 of them, we built three. Um, and then we started building the Virginia class. The first one was delivered 20 years ago. 
We're now on hull number 21 or 22, and yet those submarines are coming out of the yards late, right? And so Andrea Howard, who was on our editorial board, was one of the uh, members of the commissioning crew on the New Jersey. Um, and she said that that submarine, New Jersey, was delivered three years late. So a mature submarine design. We've been building them now. We're on hull number 21, I think New Jersey is. How, how can we deliver one of those three years late? That that sort of baffles me. Um, and then the, the final one, and we've talked about this on the show, is the uh, FFG-62, the Constellation class frigate, which the Navy went with a mature design. Um, and in this case, it was it selected the FREM class, which is a French and Italian class uh, frigate. Um, they've been in the French and Italian navies afloat and, and operating and deploying for more than a decade now. Um, but because, as you pointed out, that, that lack of commonality, instead of being a, an 85% commonality design, where the Navy's now at a 15% commonality, basically changed the entire ship, and it's going to be delivered at least three years late, my prediction, four or five years late for the first yeah. one. So that's... That's the baseline. That's where we are. This is uh, this is you know, this is why we're talking about this pro this problem because it's not just one or two classes of ships. It's, it's consistent across all different classes of ships, and uh, the problems and the decisions and you know it, it it it's a it's a it's a very bad stew of problems. And we've got to figure out how to get it fixed. So. First, I'll add that this isn't just a Navy problem, the polar security cutter, um, which essentially uh, comes out of NAVSI. Um, you know, the Coast Guard is, is very involved as the end user, as the customer, but it all still goes through that. Um, it's the same thing. They were given a design. They keep fiddling with it. Um, they selected a, a producer of it that probably wasn't the right producer. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that process. I don't know how that decision was made. That producer has been bought out by someone who probably is more uh, suited to a vessel of that size and category. But it isn't just a Navy problem is essentially what I wanted to say there. And I'm going to ride one of my favorite hobby horses here with the littoral combat ship. And I, I say it all the time, and I, it's, it, it is a rant. It sounds like a rant because it is a rant, but I think it's a rant that has, it is an indicator of a substantive problem. And that is that the Navy insists on calling them the independence variant and the freedom variant. And a variant implies a baseline with some changes and they are completely different ships. And the fact that the Navy continues to insist on that it is part of the delusion of, about this program, right? I mean, we, why are we pretending that they're variants? It makes zero sense. Yeah, they but, have completely different hull forms. Yeah, right? they're, they're different hulls, uh, different systems. They're, they both carry similar weapons, but not in identical loadouts. And I mean, they're just, they're different ships. One's a trimaran and one's a conventional monohull. Right. You, you don't even have to look beyond the superstructure to understand that these are not the same animal at all. Um, and I, I, the words have meaning, right? So when you insist on an inappropriate word for something, either either you don't understand it, that word does not mean what you think it means uh, from the Princess Bride, inconceivable, but or, or you're deliberately obfuscating. And I think there's I think there's obfuscation here, and I think it's indicative of a culture that says we can't admit we have a problem. We have two completely different ships, and we call them variants. Why? Um, I, gosh, the list of these things is so big and so complicated, and anyone who's ever seen the movie Pentagon Wars can get a pretty quick idea of what goes on with this stuff. I think it's got to be what happened with Frem, right? We, The whole purpose of that was build an existing ship that we can build quickly. We'll change what we have to to get our systems on it. Maybe we want a different sonar. Maybe we don't want the bow sonar, which we don't. If you look at the profile of the ship, that projection is not there. Um, there's, you know, maybe we want a different gun. Great, fine. Our helo needs on the, on the flight deck are a little bit different. No problem. It's bigger. It's wider. It draws more. 
and you know, it's allegedly chalked up to swap space, weight, and power for additional systems coming online later. But this is the opposite of the Ford class. There isn't any revolution in military affairs on this thing. So it's hard to fathom why you would need to change it so much. If we were putting all those fancy new systems on there, um, yeah. <laughs> like I said, I was having a hard time before the thing, before this podcast, uh, getting my blood pressure under control and obviously <laughs> it's getting worse. Anybody who's watching is seeing me get redder and redder in the face. Yeah. I, I want to talk about some uh, root causes. We won't, we won't go too long, but this is going to be actually a short uh, episode today because we really wanted to tee this up um, and let people know that one, the Naval Institute proceedings, we've noticed this problem. We understand it is a problem. We're getting to the end of the American Sea Power project. The, uh, the, the curated material for that project will be in uh, kind of ending, rolling out uh, in September and through this fall. And so we started thinking, well, what's the next project? What's the next big thing? And it, it, it didn't take us more than about 10 seconds to realize Shipbuilding is the problem. Shipbuilding is the thing that the Navy and everyone who is who is um, passionate about the Navy and making the Navy better uh, has got to be focused on shipbuilding. We've got to get this problem solved. And so uh, we just wanted to tee, tee this up, uh, talk about it for a, a little bit today, and then let you know let you all, our audience, think about it. Um, and start writing for it, right? Start jotting some things down, whether it can be a, a short commentary or a feature article uh, or a submission perhaps for our upcoming general prize essay contest. Um, but this is a topic we would like to see and publish more on because we think it is incredibly important. Uh, just uh, for, for a couple of minutes, I wrote down uh, as we were getting ready for this, some of the root causes and I've heard these from a variety of different people uh, over the last five or six years. One was um, uh, a lack of consistent demand signal. And I hear this from people and, I, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, it, it resonates with me. People in industry, um, there was, there, you know, there was, there's still hell to pay for sequestration and the, the, you know, the, the budget acts of like 2010, 2012, 2013. Um, and so, you know, it it wreaks havoc on on uh, tier one and then second and third tier suppliers. When the Navy says, "Hey, we want to buy ten of something," and then a year later, well, we can really only afford to buy seven, and then it goes, "Well, maybe it's six, and maybe we're going to stretch this out over five years or eight years instead of three years." So that lack of a consistent demand signal is part of the problem, right? That is one of the things that we've heard. Um, another one is lack of capacity. So at the end of the Cold War, when the you know the Navy was building up towards 600 ships, and then suddenly the you know the Cold War ended, and the Soviet Navy went home and rusted at its piers, and we didn't have a pure Navy, we didn't have a blue water threat anymore. Um, there was this massive consolidation in the defense industry, um, and the Pentagon kind of demanded that they basically said, "Look, we're not going to be able to afford." all of you different companies, the multitudes of companies that build ships or build radar systems or build weapon systems or aircraft. Um, and so there was this huge consolidation. And that's now we're, we're at the point where for the Navy, there's really, there's two shipbuilders. Um, and then, uh, you know, and there's two submarine builders, right? And so that's not a lot of excess capacity. There's also a consolidation in the, the, uh, public shipyards. So the, the Navy got rid of a couple of public shipyards at the end of the uh, of the Cold War. And so that has had an impact on capacity to maintain uh, the current fleet. Um, budget shortfalls are kind of part of that, you know, demand signal uh, consistency. Um, and then uh, right now, skilled workers, right? So this is a a massive thing that impacts all aspects of the U.S. economy. We sort of happily offshored manufacturing in this country uh, to countries where the labor was a lot less expensive, most, most notably China, but other countries as well. And when we offshored 
um, all sorts of industries that impacts the defense industry. It impacts shipbuilding. And so now the number one shipbuilding companies and countries in the world are, you know, China, Japan, South Korea, et cetera, Germany in, in, uh, in some, uh, uh, you know, critique uh, in niche ways. Um, but the lack of skilled workers who can do the kinds of things like the skilled welders and electricians and pipe fitters, you know, that's a problem. Um, and then engineering risk is another one where, I don't, and I think this is, has something to do with requirements creep. And that gets back to, you know, Secretary Rumsfeld on the Ford class. Like the, an engineer like Tal Manville would, would have advised, no, let's take the first class of the Ford, the first ship of the class, um, and put two or three new things in it, but not six or seven, right? And then the second one will put another one or two. And then the third one, would, and then when you get back to the Ford and she comes in for her 20 year, 25 year mid cycle overhaul, then you backfit those things. And we successfully did that. So a good example of a, of a shipbuilding program that went well, I think is the Arleigh Burke class where that has been spiral developed. You went from, you went from the originals to a flight two to a flight two A and now a flight three. Um, and now we're getting to the end of the space weight power capability uh, for the Burke class, right? They're pretty different ships from flight one to flight three. They look very similar. Yeah. Although now we've put the new sea whip on them. We started to put that on and giving them those squirrel with nuts in its cheek look. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but good those, were, those were, we're not making revolutionary changes with all the different systems from one to another, right? We're making slow modifications. We're making um, uh, changes to the ship, I think in a very logical pattern, like, okay, now it's time to add a, a, a helicopter you know, hangar. Now it's time to upgrade to this weapon system or this radar system. Uh, but it's not, it's not going from hull one to hull two is a revolutionary change. It's from hull one to hull 50, you've got a series of changes. And uh, yeah, it, it seems to have, gone much better. You're accepting less engineering risk along the way um, in, a, in a much more um, modified and um, sort of risk tolerant way, I guess you would say. So uh, uh, I don't know, other thoughts from you, Brian, and then we should probably wrap this up. Well, I mean, the, the most important thing I've heard from you is if the Soviet Union could have held on just a little longer, we wouldn't be in this mess. I'm probably going to get angry letters and tweets about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a perverse way in which it's true, but obviously winning the Cold War was awesome, and I shouldn't regret that. Um, there's two things. Um, two of the most successful projects of the 20th, 20th century for the Navy were the Polaris missile and the, um, uh, the Aegis combat system. And part of that is... Uh, Red Baron, the admiral who was in charge of the Polaris missile system, and Wayne Meyer, the father of Aegis, had their eyes on the prize, and they had were able to bring consistent focus and stay with the project from beginning to end. Developing a missile and developing a combat system is not as complicated as building a ship. I understand that. But there are a lot of lessons for the Navy in those programs, many of which have been published in our Naval History magazine and, and to some degree even in recent proceedings, more so in the era in the 60s when those uh, when the missile was developed and in the 80s and 90s when Aegis was developed and advanced. Neither one of those programs was perfect. Neither one of those systems was perfect, uh, but they were 80 to 90 to 95 percent solutions by the time they were in the fleet and had been working in the fleet for a little bit. And Aegis has reached the point where it's a, I mean, it's a completely different system in some ways. Uh, but it's it, it, just as the Flight 3 Burks are really not the same ship as the Flight 1, there's a positive line of development. And uh, it started by insisting on getting a good baseline development and empowering somebody to, to get that. I, I, I want to be clear, you know, there's a way in which it can be a circular fi firing squad with everybody saying whose fault it is that we are here. Uh, I don't think anybody is acting with bad intentions in this. I don't think the contractors are creating problems to do anything unethical. I think the people, uh, you started with this comment and I'll reiterate it. The people on the ships are doing tremendous work. 
uh, figuring out how to use what they have, figuring out how to make it better, make it functional, get innovative with it. Um, but we need we need collectively to make some decisions about how we go about this. And then we've had PEOs write about this uh, in the last, last seven months. Um, they've talked about how they need to partner better with industry. And many of them have said the Navy is taking back more of the baseline design, which maybe that's a good thing because the Navy knows what it needs and isn't pushing off on contractors' decisions by you know the proverbial committee that designed um, a horse and turned out with a camel. Uh, so there's, there's goodwill here, which is helpful. Um, but there are successes in the Navy's history that the Navy can and should learn from. And a lot of it's in the pages of proceedings. Hopefully, as you put your call out, more of them to come will be in the pages of proceedings. Yeah, I think uh, another one that, uh, of the 20th, 20th century, of course, is uh, Navy nuclear power. And you got, you know, Admiral Rickover, and, and he had some warts, but he was, he was the guy, right? He was the driving force. He never took his eyes off that prize, right? We will have uh, nu the best nuclear power, the, the best power system uh, of any Navy in the world, and we'll have it on our surface combatants, our carriers, uh, and our submarines, and and that drove a whole culture. It drove a training program. It drove, uh, you know, uh, procurement excellence uh, across the board. And I think that's a, a good example. I want to end with a, a bright spot. Um, and this is, you know, there's been, as you pointed out, there have been lots of ideas about how to solve some of these problems in our pages already. We want to see more of those ideas in the pages of proceedings. But, you know, of interest is, uh, you know, some people have mentioned, we, we've actually even had it in our pages. And then SECNAV Carlos del Toro uh, recently has toured some American shipyards. Philly Shipyard is one that is a, a, a target of a possible acquisition by a Korean uh, shipbuilding company. I can't remember which company it is off the top of my head. Um, but he also toured some Japanese and Korean shipyards overseas. We had, um, uh, Lieutenant J.G. Kim, who's written on this topic a lot, talking about, you know, the potential to do some of the maintenance that needs to be done on the on the U.S. fleet in foreign shipyards. Del Toro's talked about um, possibly doing some of the uh, hull uh, building of ships and then bring, you know, because they're th those foreign shipyards are really good at building hulls, right? And the, you know, perhaps some of the, um, you know, the, the, the power systems and electrical systems, and then bring them here and outfit them with the weapon systems and the sensor suites that they need to have. But start to um, at least chip away at that backlog of both maintenance and new construction by bringing in some of the capacity of allied shipyards until you can improve the capacity of what we have here in the United States. I think that's a it, it's a promising idea. I don't know if it will go anywhere because there's obviously always concerns in Congress about spending U.S. defense dollars in foreign company with foreign companies or foreign you know countries. Uh, but it is one of the possible ideas. To me, it is a uh, a possible bright spot. Um, and those are the kinds of ideas you know we're looking for. So if you're hearing this and you're interested in writing for us. And you've got a perspective on this problem from either a user perspective or a supplier perspective or a designer engineering perspective. Uh, we want to hear from you. So how do you how do you write for us? Uh, you can go to USNI.org, uh, click on proceedings. And on the second tier nav across the bottom of the proceedings page, you'll see a tab that says contact us. So USNI.org, proceedings, contact us. And that's where you find the information about how to write for proceedings. There's a web portal, so you can write your article, write your commentary. You can submit it uh, via the web portal, and then it gets entered in our system, and we'll start doing the evaluation process, and, and that leads to uh, publication. If we select your article for a feature article, uh, we normally pay $300 for, uh, for feature articles. Um, or if you think that this is a great topic and you want to write about it for one of our upcoming essay contests, you can go to usni.org, proceedings, and then essay contest because we've got a few contests coming up. 
The general prize essay contest is right around the corner. It is. The deadline for that contest is uh, 31 uh, October, I think. Yeah, right? Halloween. So coming up, uh, you know, that's just a couple of months from now. And uh, shipbuilding and how to improve shipbuilding and, and increase the size of the fleet would be a great topic for the general prize essay contest. So just, uh, I, just don't write LCS variant in it. I'm usually the first reader on these and you, you're, you're at minus points as soon as you say variant. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. All right. Uh, any, any parting shots, Brian? No, uh, we, we need to figure it out. And proceedings has helped. Proceedings was born to figure out shipbuilding. In fact, the fleet had deteriorated uh, after the Civil War so badly that the Naval Institute was formed to say, "How do we get the Navy back?" In essence, that's kind of where we are again, 150 years later. So, please take advantage of the open forum and help us figure it out, and help the Navy and Congress figure it out. They do read it. There are people on Capitol Hill who read it every month. There are people in OpNav who read it every month. They are listening. We just have to talk about demand signals. We have to send a demand signal for getting this right. Yeah, yeah, amen. All right. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers. Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. Your support is important to everything we do. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today by going to usni.org slash join. Until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.